OCO. OCO. Um, so I want to talk to you today about this marathon that Gabe talks about, and that's my personal journey. And I want to talk about choices because I think each one of us is faced with different choices along this long path. Uh, I come from a community of storytellers, and so uh, telling a journey story is appropriate to this community. Uh, so I, the path I'm going to relay here today has to do with my scientific career, uh, being lucky, uh, why my roots and my culture is important to me and I think to all of you, and how it affects all of us, especially uh, in mentoring. And then choices along the paths. There's this. So we all have to make choices. And, I, and several events happened in my career that led me to a choice to, to devote more time and energy to mentoring. And then also it's a story of persistence. So I'm a cell biologist, and we study this beautiful process called cell division. Uh, we use marine eggs as a model, which has been wonderful because it's enabled me to, to do research all over the country in beautiful marine stations and in my own laboratory and all over the world. So uh, interested in basic science. So uh, as a beginning assistant professor in 1976, a long time ago, the journey is going to begin. I'd never heard of Sockness. It had been founded two years earlier. A couple, one of my colleagues uh, at Dartmouth College, where I was an assistant professor, uh, was one of the founders of Sockness. She was in the anthropology department. And she said, you've got to come to this meeting. And so in 1977 or 8, I'm getting old, and so I can't quite remember what year it was, I went to my first Sockness meeting. It was in the basement of a Holiday Inn in Albuquerque. Now, my recollection was that there were about 50 people there, many fewer than are in this audience today. But it had a profound effect upon me. Because there I got to know some of my mentors uh, who've, who've I've grown up with over the past 40 years, uh, and also uh, recognizing that I wasn't alone was very important. So I went to college, I went to community college, and yay community college. Actually, actually, actually back then they called it junior college, right? So I went to JC, and then I went to uh, uh, state college. And I went to JC because of economics, and I went to JC because I wasn't a very good student in high school. Uh, I discovered science late in high school, and I loved it. And so uh, I improved and persisted there and uh, was able to transfer, did undergraduate research with a great mentor. Uh, uh, there were none of these programs available at that time, none of this MARC or MBRS or RISE or all of these wonderful programs that the NIH or REUs from NSF provide you today. But there were mentors back then as well, and people who took you under their wing and uh, provided opportunities for undergraduate research. So I really appreciate and thank those wonderful people for doing that and opening my eyes to science. I went to graduate school, and uh, I was doing really good in graduate school, did some nice science, a couple of nice papers. But I was really feeling like I didn't belong. You know that thing they talk about now called the imposter syndrome? It didn't have a name back there. But it, but it really felt that way uh, because of my roots. And so this is one of my choices. Here's uh, my mother and father and my great grandmother who's a medicine woman uh, from Oklahoma. I was raised in northern New Mexico, family in Oklahoma. My mother's Scotch-Irish. So I'm a real American blend. But indeed, uh, that culture made a difference in my life. Growing up, hearing Cherokee spoken, I can barely speak it at a kindergarten level. I have to admit, I'm sad to admit. Uh, but the culture is very rich. 
going to powwows or uh, on weekends or, or going to ceremonials and green corn ceremony, all of that is just part of who I am. So here I'm in graduate school. And of course, I, I don't look like an Indian off the reservation, right? We all can see that. And uh, it was a very private thing. I was not in that culture. Nobody knew I was an Indian. No, why would anybody ask if you're an Indian? But I was feeling like I didn't belong. And so, uh, like most departments, the department is always hiring. And so they had a job candidate come through for the area of developmental biology, which was what I was studying. And I looked at this guy and I said, oh my God, that's an Indian. That's an Indian scientist doing science that I love. And he's doing really good science. He became one of my mentors. His name was Cliff Poudry. He was a postdoc at the time. Many of you in the audience may know him. Many of you young undergraduates are benefiting from his initiatives at the NIH. Many of us at SACNAS benefit from his ideas and his leadership. So there was somebody I could see that I related to. Uh, of course, I met him about six years later, or five years later, at the SACNAS meeting uh, in the basement of the Holiday Inn. I got to talk to him in person. About the same time, so I was a faculty member at this institution, and again, you know, my resume was my resume. Uh, I didn't put on my resume, oh, by the way, I'm a Cherokee, right? Um, so I'm at a faculty meeting. Right? I'm an assistant professor, you know, two or three years into it, which means, you know, before the meeting, people are standing around talking in clusters, and I'm kind of like this, kind of scared because you know, I'm afraid one of these old farts is going to talk to me and say something, right? Of course, these old farts are younger then than I am now. But. So there's one of these famous guys. And he says uh, something, I won't repeat what he said, but it was racist, and it was sexist, and it just shocked me. It stunned me. And uh, there were two bad things that happened there. One is that nobody, you know, 20 faculty all heard him. Nobody said anything. Nobody challenged him. And then upon reflection, of myself, I said, I didn't say anything. I didn't challenge him. And so that kind of shook me to my core as to my own values. Now, of course, there's power differential and all of that, so you can understand why I just sat there and didn't do anything. This is right about the time I discovered Sackness. Now, I had been lucky as an assistant professor, as a scientist, and that luck was recruiting absolutely brilliant graduate students and postdocs. And the gift I had as a scientist, which I think I still have, is to get out of their way and let them do some absolutely brilliant work, steer them a little bit, advise them a little bit, but let them launch into their own ideas and let them follow their noses. And it's important that when you follow your nose, you're going to run into walls sometimes. But sometimes, terrific things can result. And so we got remarkably lucky. I got these grants and publications and you know, got appointed to committees and things. And I get appointed to a committee at NIH, and I hear the, the program director or the study section, the executive secretary, they were called back then, sitting at this table for dinner saying, oh, we're under so much pressure, we have to have women on our panels. And we have to have minorities on our panels, and it's impossible to find them. And I said, well, if it helps on Cherokee. And he fell off of his chair. He was like, thank you. <laughs> I said, well, it was really nothing, you know. <laughs> I was kind of born that way. So being able to do good science turned out to open doors for me. But also at the same time, I was introduced to SACTUS, and I was introduced to 
what at the time was clearly overt racism and sexism. Now, we don't hear those things said anymore. I believe people, some people still believe those things. But it made me decide to follow a fork in the road. You know, Frost, you see a fork in the road, you take the one less well-traveled. Well, I certainly did take that fork in the road, which is the less well-traveled, which is to devote a significant amount of time toward mentoring, toward working at Sackness, toward getting on the board and being the president. And you don't know how much Gabe has to work. He has a full-time job, and he's doing this as a volunteer. You have to appreciate these great people, these great leaders for all they're doing. It's terrific. So this opportunity to mentor, for me, Sackness became a second home. It was a place where I could get together with friends who were Indian people, who were Hispanics, who were white, who were every color imaginable, and every community imaginable, who would work with me, who uh, I got to know became my dear friends, became my mentors. It gave me a chance to meet so many students over the years including our wonderful moderator, uh, who I believe, you know, we all need mentors throughout our lives. Uh, I still need mentoring. I'm sure many of the people who work for me can assure you that I still need mentoring. But certainly, mentoring has been a theme in my career. I've been able to juggle this life as a cell biologist professionally. I go to these meetings, all my cell biology friends know me for my cell biology work. I go to SACNIS and all my friends there know me for my mentoring work. It's interesting, there's very little cross-fertilization. There's some, uh, but it's been fun. So I've had a lot of mentors from different genders, different races. And they've mentored me throughout my career. So this whole long process uh, led to uh, an opportunity. And this opportunity is really something that I personally had been waiting for for 40 years, you know, waiting for this to happen. And it happened. So I'm so lucky to be participating in this. And I'll tell you just a little bit about it. So there was this research, right? Research is great. There's research published in 2011 in Science Magazine showing that sort of all things being equal, African-Americans and domestic-born Hispanics were about 20% less likely to get an NIH big grant, the big fancy one called an R01. That led to a lot of wringing of hands at every government agency, like the NIH. And they did what every government agency would do in the face of bad news. They set up a commission. And they called it a working group. This working group worked for a year to decide to put forth a major diversity initiative to try to change the face of the biomedical workforce. Who gets to participate? Who gets to lead? I say that changed the face uh, because about 20 years ago, when I was president of SACNIS, every year that one of the big responsibilities of the president, at least back then, was, OK, what's going to be the theme for the next meeting? Come up with a theme. And so the theme I came up with is changing the face of science. And it seems to have stuck. <laughs> um, and so the opportunity to do this was just terrific. So they funded this giant initiative with experiments going on at predominantly minority-serving institutions that are predominantly undergraduate, not all of them, 10 of those. One national research mentoring network whose goal is to provide culturally responsive mentoring to mentees from the undergraduate level all the way through the junior faculty, mentor training training mentors to be better mentors through online courses, through in-person in workshops, to help postdocs and junior faculty write grants that are competitive, to address this gap, 
to identify networks to help them network better, because clearly networking is a big problem in our communities. So how do we better prepare our graduate students and our postdocs and our junior faculty to be part of consortia, be part of groups, to make an impact? It's got a match.com for, for mentees and mentors, a four-month online mentoring relationship you can, you can participate in. There, go sign up, NRMN Net. Okay? Please sign up. Just Google us. You'll find us. We're the first thing that comes up. I love Mr. Google. So I'm going to give you just some simple advice. It's important sometimes to listen to your elders. Not always. But I think the messages I hope I can convey is persistence really counts. Hard work really counts. Of course, being lucky and occasionally being smart really helps, but being persistent. You've got to do the best science you can. Don't settle for doing average science. Aspire to be the leader. Aspire to make the changes in, in your discipline. Aspire to be on the cover of science. The other advice I give for those of you who want to give back to your communities you don't have to, but if those of you who want to give back to your communities and do things for others, is to establish your credibility first. Your voice will be much louder if you have credibility amongst your peers in your own discipline. Too many junior faculty take on too many responsibilities in terms of listening to the provost or the dean saying, won't you please come and serve on this committee because you're the only black faculty member we have in chemistry. And I want to have a diverse committee. You don't get credit for tenure in doing those kind of things. You have to, have to learn how to say yes appropriately. Yes, Mr. Provost, I would love to serve on that committee after I get tenure. <laughs> so learning, learning the skills of the trade, that's mentoring. So establish your credibility first, because once you're a credible scientist or mathematician or engineer in your own field, people will listen to you. Oh, that's a smart person there. She really is one of the up-and-comers in her field, and she happens to be Latina. Let's hear what she says. So learn to say no judiciously. And then if you choose, mentor, give back. Give back to your community. Advise, share your stories, your path. It's important for the next generation to, to hear your journey. It's never direct. There are unexpected paths. There are boulders to climb. There are hills to climb. It truly is a marathon. But for me, it's been absolutely a wonderful marathon, so thank you.